So uh, welcome everybody to uh, CSI Skill Tree. In this series, we take a close look at video games to examine and celebrate the work they do in envisioning the future and building rich, thought-provoking worlds. My name is Joey Eshrick uh, at the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University, and I'll be your host. Today, we're gonna talk about representations of Africa and Africans in video games through the lens of 80 Days, uh, which is an alternate history adaptation of Jules Verne's 1872 novel, Around the World in 80 Days. The game was developed by the British indie studio, Inkle, in collaboration with uh, the publisher, Profile Books, and it was published in 2014. Uh, the lead writer for the game, Meg Giant, won uh, a UK Writers Guild Award for her work on this game. And it was also, uh, I find this very funny, named a best game of the year by Time Magazine. Who knew they named a best game of the year? Uh, but it was this one in 014. Uh, it's available uh, on a bunch of different platforms if you want to try to play it after this conversation, on mobile devices, on Mac and PC, on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, you play as a character named Passapartout. He is a valet for Phileas Fogg, who's a British gentleman seeking to make his way around the world uh, on a bet, on a wager. Uh, and we'll dive a bit more into the game's world building style and mechanics really shortly. Uh, so even as game culture and development expands around the world, there are still few games that take, take African characters and the continent's diverse cultures and societies seriously. African characters and cultures are often flattened, stereotyped, uh, portrayed as faceless villains or especially victims in need of a white savior. 80 Days, as you'll see, provides an opportunity to see how a game might approach representing, representing Africa and Africans in unique and nuanced ways, while also demonstrating some gaps and blind spots and assumptions that are worth delving into. Uh, I'm honored to be joined today by Deji Bryce Alukatun, who's uh, often in the business of presenting fresh and compelling Hello. visions of Africa and Africans. Hey, Deji. Uh, working in alternative pasts, presents, and in the future. And uh, Deji brought this game to my attention, and, and so thanks so much for, uh, for giving, giving me such a, a thought-provoking game to play. Uh, Deji is, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about him, the author of the novels After the Flare and Nigerians in Space, and his short story Between the Dark and the Dark was included in the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy 2020. He's the winner of the Philip K. Dick Special Citation, and After the Flare in 2017 was uh, chosen as one of the best books of the year by The Guardian and The Washington Post. Uh, he's an attorney focused on emerging technologies. He's a Future Tense Fellow at New America, and he is a member of our Imaginary College at CSI as well. And before that, uh, he defended persecuted writers around the world at PEN America. So just a little map of the uh, conversation today. We'll start by talking about the game's overall narrative structure and mechanics. And, and, and while we're doing that, uh, we'll run a real-time, lightly edited gameplay video showing uh, Fog and Passapartout making their way through Africa. So we hope this gameplay helps to provide a sense of the visual style and the interactive elements as we talk about them. Uh, then we'll turn off the gameplay as we shift into uh, analyzing the game's representational choices and patterns, talking a little bit about Deji's own work and uh, pursuing other topics that come up. And finally, uh, and importantly, we'll turn to responding to your questions and comments. So throughout the conversation, anytime, don't wait till the end necessarily, uh, as soon as something occurs to you, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window uh, and you can submit a question or a comment there. And we really look forward to hearing what you all think uh, and, and queries you have as we talk. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and thank you, Deji, for being with me. And, and without further ado, let's get underway. Sounds great. So you should see, yes, you should see some gameplay video up here and it'll just sort of run quietly as we talk, hopefully. But um, so Deji, could you start uh, by talking us uh, through what 80 Days is a bit, uh, how it adapts Vern's novel and what the experience of playing is like? Yeah, thanks, Joey. Um, and, and thanks for including me. It's, it's such an honor to be a, a, a fellow um, uh, at CSI and uh, to be in conversation with you again. Um, so the game, as you said, is, is a retelling and reimagining of 80 days. Um, and it is somewhat of what you might call a choose your own adventure. And as you can see on the screen now, uh, you have different choices that you can click on. And as you uh, make those choices as the valet or butler of um, uh, Phileas Fogg, um, it opens up new pathways um, in the story. And um, unlike uh, the original novel, which is um, where Phileas Fogg is much more of an active protagonist. In this, um, Passepartout, uh, as a butler, you're making most of the choices, you're planning the trip, 
uh, you're not just making him comfortable, but you're also deciding where to go. And when he's asleep, resting in the hotel, you're going out and talking to different characters and learning things. Um, it has some game mechanics, basic game mechanics, um, like uh, you have to manage a budget. Uh, you have to trade, you can trade different goods that you acquire in markets along the way. And that helps you manage your, your money and your funds. Um, and then you have to worry a little bit about uh, Phileas Fogg's health. Um, so it's, it's a really addictive game. Um, I was really pleased to learn that it was replayable after I played it a few years ago. Um, and uh, it's been uh, ported over to different platforms, uh, which, which means that um, wh what I've heard is that the game has updated some of the storylines as they've made it available to things like Nintendo Switch or uh, you know, put it on some of the other platforms. So it's, it's, it's very addictive and a lot of fun. Um, and if you're a literary type like myself, it's very enjoyable because the writing is just extraordinary um, by Meg Giants and um, her ability to capture the voice of, uh, you know, um, uh, 18th, 19th century writing and Jules Verne, I mean, Jules Verne's written in French, but the, the basic, um, you know, uh, uh, tone of the piece, it's really hard to do. Um, I should mention that there's this steampunk element um, and you can see that. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with steampunk, um, there's, you know, some famous stories would be the Golden Compass um, or his Dark Materials. Uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen by Alan Moore, or if you've just seen the movie Wild Wild West, by uh, which stars Will Smith. Not a good movie. I uh, wouldn't recommend it, but if you want to know. Oh, I don't know about of... that. <laughs> Let's not go not to war with my childhood here. No, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, not my favorite. But um, uh, it, so, so it's, a, it's an active uh, genre that this, this film explores, and you can kind of see that in the background on this, on this image of a, uh, an airship, uh, an African airship. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the main things that hits me is that it's, it's a map game. You can really see that um, on, on the screen. And uh, the writer Meg Giant actually wrote another game called Sunless Sea, uh, which is, is also a, a British game. And it's, uh, it, you're, you're on a ship and you're largely exploring and, and uncovering this map and this weird fiction version uh, of, of sort of an underworld Britain, underworld British empire. It's a game where you're, 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 you're both doing choose your own adventure on, on the screen in text, as you can actually see on the screen right now, but there's a, a, a lot of the negotiations you're having is with, is with the world map and exploring different cultures and seeing how different cities that you alight on and different routes that you travel are, are departing from the history that you, that you might know. So you might go to Germany or Russia or Egypt and find that things are not quite as you expect that they would be in the 1870s. And I think, there is something about like if you enjoyed, um, like I did, like playing around with atlases and maps when you were a kid and drawing maps and things like that, then this game will really appeal to you um, because it is about sort of traversing space and you can get lost and stuck. Sometimes the characters say they're lost. Sometimes you can get to a place and not exactly know where to go from there because your characters can't find a mode of conveyance. So uh, I don't know, it, it, it has this beautifully spatial sensibility for a, for a game that kind of plays like a book. Yeah, and I would say, um, as you can see on, on the screen, um, because um, the story deals with the effects of colonialism and uh, you know, the impact of uh, colonial powers kind of fighting each other and wrestling for countries, some countries have already um, thrown off the shackles of colonialism and taken back uh, their original names or rebranded a city that was once um, considered, um, and, and I can think of Port Elizabeth, um, you know, in, in South, present day South Africa, um, it's been overthrown uh, by the, the Zulu Federation and um, now has an African name. So there's, you get to cities that you expect on the map, you expect them to look or be called a certain way, and, but they don't have that name. They're called something else. Um, you see that all over the world. And, and that playfulness um, is, uh, again, makes the game really fun to explore. Uh, we should also say you encounter kind of real life events sometimes as well. So I'm, I'm thinking of, and, it, and it's a little ahistorical because I, I checked and there wasn't a World's Fair in Paris in 1872, but you do run across a World's Fair. And, and I think it's pretty clearly meant to uh, nod to the um, International uh, Exposition in 1889. So there's still this kind of like late 19th century World of Wonders kind of thing, but 
but it, it's really interesting and jarring in terms of the storytelling and in terms of Africa that when you get to that World's Fair, one of the major plot threads there is that you encounter this Zulu Federation exhibit and you get to interact with uh, a Zulu soldier. And you can sort of decide how that interaction goes, whether your character is sort of shaken and made nervous by this, uh, you know, this, this armed black man or whether, or whether you kind of have like a moment of kinship with him and, and it turns into a light moment. But that's a lot of what you're doing in this game too, is like, you're kind of like um, exploring a, a new world for yourself and for the characters who, who, are, who are pretty sophisticated and worldly within Western Europe, but don't have a broader sense of the globe beyond Western Europe, uh, you get the sense. And uh, you can decide kind of how paranoid and reactive they're gonna be in the face of all of this difference and all of this diversity, or you can decide that they're gonna kind of roll with the punches and, and try to understand people and get on a level with them. And, you know, follow people down alleys and get involved with their stories and things like that. So that's kind of like um, that. I think that's a, some where, where some of the fun and dynamism of the gameplay comes. It's just like kind of role playing your character. Yeah, and and you do have choices. You can actually um, do things that are legal. You can smuggle. You can uh, fight. You can steal. Um, and related to um, encounters with Africa, um, Passport Two almost always has a choice of. Uh, you can choose the colonial attitude um, as someone who might be, say, a British or French subject encountering some new culture. You can choose that attitude that they're beneath them or they're barbarians. But then there's always a choice that you can also ask the question, oh, what's going on here? Maybe I should explore that a little more. And I think that um, makes the game also really fun. You mentioned the World's uh, Fair, Joey. I think that's where the game uh, really blows open because you you actually don't have to visit it. You can go through Paris, so that's the first stop, and you can ignore it um, and just continue on. And you'll still learn things along the way. But if you do go to the World's Fair, that's where you meet um, you know, African airships. You learn about um, this uh, artifice, um, sorry, yeah, the artifice guild, artificers, um, which is kind of this technological um, uh, ruling class. Um, and, and I know we're gonna dig into that a, a little bit more, but um, when I just, I just wanted to mention one other thing, um, this idea of um, automata and automatons, um, that actually is mentioned within the first few pages of the original novel, the Jules Verne novel, um, more as a, an aside and a curiosity that uh, Passepartout and Phileas Fogg, um, I think it might even be compared to an automaton. Uh, but those um, kinds of robots, the, the writers um, took that concept and ran with it. So they're not just an aside, they're actually central to the story. So throughout the story, you're encountering these, they're almost like robots, but with, um, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, steampunk uh, imagining of that. Um, they are simple in some ways, in other ways, depending on where you go, uh, they have more magical elements. So I, I know we're going to dig into that too. Yeah, there's kind of like uh, a lot, you know, just for, again, for folks who are more or less familiar with steampunk, there's just even just on the basic level, there's, you can see there's, there's something called a Shaba Millie copper ship, which is a, uh, uh, an, an, an East African form of, of, of sky transportation. Um, there's a lot of pneumatic tubes in this game, uh, a lot of use of, of, of steam power in ways that may, we maybe didn't see. There is even just in terms of uh, a sort of realistic embracing of steam technology, there's just a lot of trains in this game. If you want, you can cross most of the world using trains. Uh, it's not a particularly good way to get through most of Africa, but if you go through Russia, for example, which the game likes you to do, you can, um, you can do most of that via train. And you certainly do that when you get to North America, if you go through um, uh, the United States. So there's that, you know, there's a lot of gears. And then as, as Deji said, there's, there's automata in, in human form and animal form. There's sometimes some cyborg characters that you can come across in some of the sort of optional narrative segments, um, including a, a woman who's been like grafted together with an airship and has kind of become this new type of being. And your character does, does not know what to do with that and almost has a fit. Um, so yeah. yeah just I mean, on, the, on, the, on the Shaba Meli that you mentioned, one of the details I loved about that um, is that they, and, and this shows the research they did to make it feel real, is they said that it was created from the minds of Katanga in uh, white, you know, present day uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, which is a very mineral rich country. And why that's fun is that it just showed they went that extra mile to say, oh, Africans should have airship. Well, they actually, 
the writers actually said, well, how would they, how would they have created those airships? And, and what would be the technical means of doing that? And I think for, from my perspective, that, that adds another layer um, to the story, which makes it fun. Yeah, it really takes like late 19th century and early 20th century uh, kind of Anglo-European science fiction tropes that, that clearly the writers liked and kept them. Like the idea that this is sort of a techno-social story. It's really attentive to resource flows, issues of like the economic relationship between the core and the periphery. It's really mindful of class issues. Um, it's really mindful of how like uh, how important it is to control resources. When you get into Africa, you find all of these um, these 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 nations in which like they've they've taken control of the material resources and marshaled them in various uh, technocentric ways to gain power, just in ways that are different than the reality that we uh, experienced uh, in our timeline. But they're ways that are really grounded. It's not like things are just happening magically, and you usually can sort of like learn what the scientific, technical, and sort of resource management underpinning is of all of the changes in the world. So I think it's like a really, um, it's sort of a, it's a game that's really mindful of sort of the politics of technology um, in a big way. So Deji, is there anything else that we should uh, mention or emphasize in terms of the mechanics? Because, you know, it strikes me that this is a, a, a game that's, that was created by a, a game studio, Inkle, and, and then Profile, which is a, a book publisher, a fairly traditional book publisher. And so, it, it, it really does want to, I think, market itself as like an experience of reading, but with game mechanics. Uh, is it, yeah. Or, and I, did you have a favorite mechanic or something that you think worked really well narratively? I think just the choices that uh, very occasionally, um, most of the choices you make as you're selecting what dialogue or what action you want to do, they have some consequence. Um, there are a few, you know, exceptions to that. If you're asking for directions or finding out how to get from point A to point B, there might be repetitive conversation. But um, what I've seen written, and I don't know if it's confirmed, but that um, the writers wrote 700,000 words, uh, you know, seven novels and contained within a game. And you can see that. Um, and there's very few throwaway paragraphs or descriptions. Most of them, um, as, as a writer, you can tell they paid attention to the rhythm of the the writing, um, the details, they take the time to describe oceans and flowers and try to create a sense of awe. So I think just the, that the putting in that extra work is really what uh, makes it very special. Um, the trading is fun. Um, and, uh, you know, should we talk about, there's also these sets that you can um, yeah, I was going to mention way, that. Yeah, I think that yeah. gets to the role playing. Yeah, there are these sets of uh, gear that you can get. So there might be like a machete and like a, a brimmed hat and like some waiters or something. And that'll be like the jungle traveler set. Or there's um, one that's more like comfort oriented, where I think it's like you have like a, a neck pillow or something and, and an altimeter. And like that's the set that makes it more comfortable to travel by air. Uh, or there's the English gentleman set, which is like, you know, a top hat and some fancy clothes. And they each like bring certain types of benefits with them. Sometimes you can, with the fancy gentleman set, you can renegotiate um, some of your travel. So you can get a discount on some of your fares, uh, riding a train or something, or you can encourage the people running the services to leave earlier and save you time. Cause you can lose this game if you don't finish your circumnavigation of the globe in 80 days. So you can kind of like squeeze people a little bit if you have certain clothes on, but also sometimes your health, which can go up and down or Fogg's health, um, it won't go down as much if you have some of these sets. So it does encourage you to kind of like take certain paths over others based on what gear you have. But it also, for me, it was a fun bit of flavor to like imagine the characters changing clothes for different settings and things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I don't know about you. What did you think of the, what did you think of the yeah, gear Yeah, I loved it. That, 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 those were the, you know, actually it was you who told me how big of an impact they had, because uh, I hadn't experienced that yet, but they do actually impact the gameplay. So again, nothing's really a throwaway. Um, and it's just the funny little details, drinking tea, playing dominoes, uh, giving uh, Phileas Fogg a shave makes him happy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it, it really, uh, you know, the game, just because of the choices you can make, the, the kind of uh, master-servant relationship, it, it really poses that question, you know, how much are you willing to please this person um, and complete his quest when, you know, it turns out the real journey is what um, Passepartout, who was on the left of that screen, um, what he's exploring. So it's, it's just a lot of fun. 
Yeah, yeah. You often have to make a decision between like exploring the city or talking to someone on the airship you're on and like sort of learning more about um, uh, where, where you're going or even like learning some, uh, some alternate paths forward across the globe or like combing Fogg's hair or something or like yep. ironing his shirt. And he does like if you do that, but like you actually have to sacrifice information to keep your relationship with him robust. Um, and, and people will, will, will frequently ask you, um, they think it's very strange that you're somebody's servant, like in, in some cultures, they'll say like, why are you helping this guy out? Like, why do you follow him around and do everything he says? And you, you can decide to shade that in various ways. Sometimes you say that you're a professional and you're proud of being a valet, or sometimes you say like, ah, oh, you know, say la vie, that's the way it is. Some people are on top, some people are on the bottom. And, uh, I think that, yeah, that, that push and pull is really interesting about like how friendly you really want to be with Fogg, who isn't always terribly likable. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, in in one episode, and it's not too much of a spoiler, um, people confuse you for being the person in charge. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have to decide whether you reveal that you're actually a butler uh, or or whether you are um, the, the person calling the, making the decisions. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about like, uh, what inspired us to get into talking about this game in the first place, Deji, which is, you know, when you first mentioned this to me, you said it provided a uh, representation of Africa and Africans that you found unique, especially in the world of video games and games that, that you had played. Um, so what inspired you about the game and, and what, did, what did you find particularly striking in terms of its representational choices? Thanks. Yeah. So I think around this time I had learned about this game called, or game making engine called Twine, where you could make your own video game. And I experimented with it. It's basically text adventures um, where you can, uh, you know, write your own text adventure and, and the person playing the game uh, can make different choices. Um, and, you know, so I learned a little bit about how those games are put together and how hard it is. Um, so I think around that time is when I learned about 80 Days, that there was this game that had done that really well. And I thought, why not? Um, I had just come over from... Android to iPhone, um, which sounds at silly, the time there were a lot more games on iPhone. Yeah, if <laughs> if you're doing yeah exactly. So if you're if you've ever made that switch, it's really a completely different ecosystem. Maybe now they're closer than they were. Um, and I thought, oh well, what are all the games um, on uh, iPhone? And uh, when I was living in New York, um, you know, playing a game on the subway was a great way to spend an hour. Um, and uh, you know, I got this game. So, um, and then I think immediately for some reason, you know, and you and I have discussed this, I ended up in Africa, um, but it's actually not that easy to get there. So I must've been working yeah. really hard, you know, within the game, it kind of encourages you to go in a different direction. Um, so I must've been really working hard to get to Africa. And I, I just thought, wow, I remember the name, the emperor Setswayo is the emperor of the Zulu Federation and thinking, wow, she actually did the research to find out what this person's name might have been. You know, it, it sounds so silly, but it's, it's so often that an African name is just completely made up. And I remember thinking, oh, this feels real. And then, you know, there were immediately, uh, you know, at, at the World's Fair asking, oh, can Africans really fly, you know, airships? And the types of things that questions are still asked today. Um, and just the research that went into it. I thought this, this feels real, you know, not everything is perfect. I'm sure someone from the Zulu uh, nation might not be thrilled with every aspect of this, but at least they're trying and uh, these characters have agency. And I think that's, you know, that's been a big part of what I've tried to explore in my own work. Yeah, I do actually want to uh, linger on that for a moment that it's like not so easy to get to Africa. The game um, pushes you, um, as you're starting, as you cross the channel and get into Western Europe, the game kind of tells you in a pretty like straightforward way that the best things you can do are either to go through uh, what we now contemporarily call the Middle East and into South Asia, or you can use the Trans-Siberian Railway and kind of barrel across Russia. And those are like kind of the, the I think those are like the recommended paths. I think you could think of that as like easy mode for the game in some ways, like that's the mm, most direct mm -hmm. pathway. But um, yeah. you and I have talked and done some research and tried some, partial playthroughs and found out that there's like, again, so much writing and so many ways to go. You can go to the North Pole, I just found out today. You probably shouldn't based on what I've learned, but you, but you could. Um, and uh, Africa in a way is kind of like, it has to be a deliberate choice. It's possible to miss it. Uh, if you wanna go past, you can get to Egypt pretty easily, but if you wanna go Sub-Saharan, it's like there, it's, it's pretty easy to miss. 
uh, you can talk a little bit if you'd like about, I know, I know you, you were able to get into uh, West Africa a bit, which I haven't Yeah, done. sure. Yeah, I think, um, and, and, and having, you know, the, the book, the original 80 Days, the path, the game-winning path, more or less, it seems to follow the original, the travels of Phileas Fogg and Passport 2, the basic route, the winning, you know, the strategy to get there the quickest um, uh, seems to be to follow that route. So you do have to make those choices. Um, the last time I played, um, I went uh, through, um, I think through Manila in the Philippines and then down. And, you know, I think the natural attraction and it actually happens in the book that they go through the U S because you're curious what's going to happen in the U S mm -hmm. um, what is, what is the world like there? Um, but actually I ended up going from Manila to Acapulco. There was something going on there. So I skipped that and went to Panama city, ended up in um, Brazil. And that's where you start to encounter the slave trade for the first time. So, there is some mention in East Africa of the Arab slave trade, but in Brazil, um, in the story, slavery is still legal. So um, that was uh, really sobering. Um, and you have to decide whether you want to hang out and talk with slave traders um, or, and then one of the quickest ways to get over to Africa is to take a ship that transports slaves to Brazil. So you, you're, you're presented with these ethical questions. Um, and then the depiction of West Africa um, they, you know, use the colonial borders um, and some of the ethnic groups, um, you know, it was, it was fascinating. Uh, the Yoruba ethnic group is there. Um, you can go to Timbuktu. I wanted to go check it out. So I went there. You, you end up traveling with a, a griot um, who plays, you know, you learn about the, um, the Kora and, and then Goni and these different uh, traditional West African instruments. And it's just so, so creative. Um, but that, um, you know, the moral, well, they force you at one point, you have to make a choice whether you want to be complicit uh, in the slave trade or not. Um, and um, even though, I, as I said, I was, I was trying to get ready for this conversation, I couldn't choose it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if I was a journalist, I would have chosen it and seen, but I, um, it was just, it just seemed so wrong. So I ended up not, and I told the guy who, you know, the slave trader to, I didn't say goodbye. I didn't wave to him goodbye when he left for another thing. So there's all these really fascinating depictions of Africa. And um, while I, I dislike uh, personally uh, that, you know, when there's an expectation that any story about Africans or black people needs to trend towards slavery, uh, because I think there are so many more richer, there's so many richer stories to be told, even though it's a very important part of the black experience, you know, across the Atlantic and uh, all over the world. But I, I dislike when it's forced. I dislike when you have to talk about it. And this game didn't feel like it had to talk about it. it. Said basically, this is where we're at. This is the world we're exploring. And this would have played a role. Um, and they and they still manage, I think, to give many of the African characters agency in that. So that was um, satisfying. Well, and it's telling too that it's like you're you had to take this very peripatetic path, like to even to even encounter the sort of slavery chapter of the game. Like you said, there's a little bit of mention. There's a there's some Ottoman colonization that involves some some slavery, but it's it's it, it really like that transatlantic slave trade, the traffic in black bodies, like that isn't something that the game like leads with. Your first few encounters with Africans are that they're artificers, they're flying airships, they're uh, increasingly we'll get into this royalty. Um, but many of them are, are in technical fields. That's actually kind of like, it was really striking to me that I was like, oh right, you never see this in games. And you never see this in pop culture and science fiction, honestly. It's pretty rare that like, that's the overwhelming representation in the game. I think the number of people that you come across of African descent, mo most of them, uh, and you find them all over the, all over the globe, um, are, are technologists and are inventors in many cases. Yeah, and, 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 and that's something that I've tried to explore in my own work. Um, just, just pausing on that for a second, um, there is a character, um, I don't know if I want to call this a spoiler, but um, you encounter in the desert and um, she uh, has, um, it turns out she's, uh, she was un unable to conceive a child, so she built uh, an automata child um, and um, to, 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 to be act as her child who she keeps hidden because she's afraid uh, she'll be stolen by the technocrats, the artificers guild. Um, and as a gesture of kindness, because you, you help her out, 
she gives you an early copy of the child's mind, which are, you know, in these crystals. And you're, you're able to take that with you and you, you, you can trade it in for money if you want. But they basically, she gives you in some ways the child's soul. Um, she has another copy because the child is still alive, but there's just, and that's a very technocratic thing. Uh, she's an engineer, she's an African engineer, and she's made an advance that she doesn't want to share uh, with, and, and one of the lines is, you know, the artificers of something about, you know, they, they, these, they managed to figure out how to build um, basically robots, but they didn't include a soul. And that's what mm. this African um, mm. uh, scientist has managed to create with her own child. Huh. That's really interesting. I think, you know, it's, it's really illustrative of the fact that as you are playing through this, you'll have like 10 minutes at a time, maybe where you're just like, okay, I need to like sell some stuff. So I have train fare. I've got to get to the next city. You know, you're looking around passport to maybe gets involved, maybe get pickpocketed. That'll happen. And, uh, uh, and then you'll stumble on something that's like really moving and involving, um, or just a, a, a moment that's very poetic. I, I remember at one point, we were camped out on the edge of the Zulu Federation territory waiting for like a conveyance in the next day. And my character like sort of sneaks away from fog and lays down under the stars. And he says, you know, he feels like he's on the edge of the world and that he doesn't really know where he is. Like there's this, and it, it's a really beautiful moment. I like really, uh, and I was just so sort of surprised because I was like, things have been so mundane for like, you know, and it, it really has these ebbs and flows, but um, like I haven't come across the the uh, Android child story uh, sort of segment, but that's like it, it's really illustrative of these like very kind of um, deep and involved uh, issues and and these really poignant moments that kind of like come amidst this this travelogue. I think that's sort of what makes the game hum in a way. Uh, I was struck by Deji that like when it, I think I was get, getting closer to Zulu territory and 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 at one point. Um, uh, a uh, Passapartout, who's the character that you kind of role play, says, I, "I'm not sure if going southerly, so in that in that case, it's through Sub-Saharan Africa, was quote a crazed mistake or a masterstroke." And I, don't know, I thought that was like a very interesting thing for the game to do. It was kind of like you you know you took a risk coming this way. Um, so I think yeah. there's something about Africa as kind of this like advanced strategy in the game, or, or sort of like a bonus area um, that's sort of interesting. Yeah, and uh, as, as I said before, you know, I naturally was pulled there. Um, and um, I was trying to figure out, um, uh, you know, telling my wife, I'm like, tr looking at the screen, I, I couldn't remember how I'd gotten there. So I had to, uh, I eventually figured out a way. And I don't, I'll let people discover that on their own. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you have to work for it. Um, and as you said, that, that means that you may be sacrificing something. Um, and, or maybe you're not. So it's, it's not obvious. Um, I would say it's probably easier on the other side if you get forced into, uh, you know, South America, but um, and or in the Caribbean where you can in, um, encounter Haiti and and um, some of the figures um, from Haiti um, who are accused of of building their machines from blood and <laughs> from voodoo and so it's it's super interesting, yeah. So I I wanted to just step very briefly back into kind of your own. Uh, work and your own experience writing speculative fiction about Africa and Africans. So like uh, people should go read your books, Nigerians in Space and After the Flare, and they like this game, imagine a kind of alternate history, alternate historical trajectory for the continent and for the whole globe as a, as a result of that. So I don't know, I just was wondering sort of as a, as a writer observing this enormous feat of, of interactive writing, um, you know, how do you think about this game and some of the choices that it made and, and maybe how it relates to some of your work and how you've tried to rethink Africa and the way that it tends to be represented? Yeah, thanks, Joey. So I think um, if there's overarching theme of my work, um, it's that I'm giving black people and people of African descent agency um, and intellect, um, giving them the ability to kind of make choices to have um, their own interior lives and um, that those stories are worth, are of value. Um, you know, I don't really focus on one specific culture, um, even though Nigeria features, um, Nigeria is a very diverse place. So there are different peoples from within those cultures. Um, one of which, two of both, two of which show up in the game, the Fulani and then the Yoruba, um, in, in 80 days. So, I think, um, you know, that's what I've wanted to explore. Um, it really came from passion that, uh, there were very few uh, adventure stories or African adventure stories um, with a science fiction kind of lens written. Um, 
they're now they're ex exploding. There's there's lots, um, and I think those voices were there, and and now just the market, um, the publishing market is welcoming them in films and movies. Um, but um, you know, so I think at the time I started writing some of those stories, I just didn't see them. They just weren't there. Um, even in South Africa, where there's a you know tradition of great black South African writers, um, most of the you know noir and thrillers are written by white men. So uh, I think that's that's kind of where it came from. Is that I think there should be stories like this. This is the kind of story I like to read. These are the kinds of people that I think that I know or that I would, I would love to meet. And um, you know that, that's where it came from. And, and I think the game. Um, um, well, the game, you know, 80 Days is, is kind of like a globalizing, you know, you're seeing the whole world in the story in 80 Days Around the World, Jules Verne's story. So it was, it was technology connecting the world. And, um, you know, I think that game, not just about Africa at all. I think if you left this conversation thinking that uh, you would be, um, you know, you'd be missing out uh, because you really get to expo expose to so many different cultures. Um, many of them, I don't have enough background. So I say, oh, is that, is that what it was like there? Are these the people who were, you know, kind of, uh, are these the tensions? And, you know, I think if, if they handled it as well as they did in Africa, I'm guessing that they got most of it right. So, um, you know, it's really just a, a fun globe trotting game. Yeah, do you think there's something, are, are, do you feel like you're seeing more stories kind of in this, in this vein? I think you were, like you said, you were early to like a sort of, uh, uh, hopefully what will be a continued upswing in, in African and African diasporic voices and speculative fiction. But do you feel like you see these stories more where there's kind of a, a techno-social alternate history? I mean, that's what, that, what I think is part of the kinship between this game and your writing is that it does have a real focus on technological systems. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily lean so much toward fantasy. It leans toward sort of technological realities and how they intersect with politics and then people's like, you know, lived experiences day to day. Yeah, you know, and I, I think it's, it's the world we, you know, I think that's fun to imagine back um, what um, different technologies, how they might have developed differently because we know so many inventions, um, I think it was at, you know, Bell Labs, at t just to give you an example, um, invented the answering machine in like the 1930s. Um, but it didn't make it into, well, you know, they suppressed it because they didn't see the advantage for their business. So, you know, for 30 years or however long before, you know, regular uh, consumer uh, answering machines became available, just sat in a vault because they didn't want it to. And that you can, well, what would the world have looked like if, you know, when they discovered it, they'd released it? Um, there's all kinds of technologies like that where for one reason or another, someone got to it first or filed the patent first or, and it just goes off in a completely different direction. Um, now, when you layer in the con colonialism aspect of it, where people are being deliberately shielded or prevented from getting access to technologies, it just gets even more interesting. And I think 80 days um, does that. You know, frankly, I think it's the world we live in today. Um, you know, this is a little bit of my day job bleeding in, but, you know, the top five companies are all technology companies in the United States, and they have a valuation of $5 trillion, which is a number that was not something I'd ever even seen on paper, you know, before, you know, 10 years ago. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it, it, it is the society we live in today, um, and, you um, it makes a big impact on everyone's lives. Whether you're directly working on it, some aspect of it is going to come into your life. So I, I think those stories are here to say, stay. And um, you know, in terms of uh, Africans writing them, uh, there's lots of technology booms happening in Africa all over the continent. There are people who, who've grown up with those uh, technologies who also have access to movies and sci-fi and, you know, uh, Western, you know, uh, stories from the U.S. So their imaginations are on fire and they're just trying to come up with how does it work for them. I still think there's plenty more stories to be discovered. Um, and I know many of them have appeared um, at um, ASU in, at the Center for Science and Imagination. So you're doing a great job of, of calling attention to them. Uh, but I think there's a lot more coming and uh, I think it's exciting. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, 
I, I want to remind everybody that we, you can submit a question still. We have a couple of great questions that I'm looking forward to getting to in a few minutes, but um, uh, please feel free to submit a question or comment and we would love to hear from you. Um, so I just want to, I sort of want to ask you about at least one more thing before we go to uh, questions from folks, which is just that, so in, uh, in, in, in this game and in, in the playthroughs I've experienced so far anyway, um, in Northern Africa, it's mostly Ottoman Empire colonization. That's what you're, you're working through that. Like you said, there's, uh, and, and you see some kind of like anti-colonial politics here and there. Um, in the Zulu Empire, you see Sechuayo, as you said, who's a, 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 a kind of uh, aggressively expansionist and technologically focused figure. And then um, if you go to Madagascar, it's run by an artificer queen. Um, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, but uh, her name is Rana Valona II. Um, and both of them have these technologically advanced armies with human soldiers, but also steampunk robots, some in the shape of animals like birds and jaguars. So I was wondering what you made of these kind of um, these representations of, of, of African monarchs. And uh, I, I don't know, I just, to, to just throw in my, my observation, I think like it, it, it was making me think that many kind of Afrofuturist stories, and this is sort of an Afro retro futurist story, perhaps um, that little segment of the game do have a lot of like kind of focus on like monarchs and superheroes. I don't know. I was wondering what you thought about that trope and how it played out in this game and more generally. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's a great observation. And, um, you know, royalty has a lot of different meanings in African cultures. Um, I have some royal uh, background myself. Um, it's, uh, you know, several generations back. Um, and, you know, in Nigeria, you can trace, trace it back. Uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't mean that I, I, I live in a uh, palace, you know, there. It, 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 it's just, um, but it, it has a, a meaning about, you know, dignity and the, your role in the, in the society. Um, so I'd say the definition of what that means varies, but it's not a far-fetched, you know, the story of, of the Zulu Federation. I was listening to a podcast. There, there's been, Shaka um, is the most famous Zulu warrior who fought against the British but there were several others um, who are, you know, the story has been known uh, within, within South Africa and within Zulu culture, but it's just coming out. Um, so there's this, this uh, you, know, you know, at least in, into literature form. Um, and so I'd say that there's, and those are, I think in some ways people, when thinking about Africa are looking for dignity, they're looking for tradition, they're looking to show that they achieved great things. And oddly, because uh, many of the societies were actually very well balanced and respectful of their environment, uh, didn't leave a strong material legacy. So you, you have some, you know, is, is, if the definition of a civilization is building some big temple, um, there are those in Africa and you can find them in, all over the continent. But a lot of cultures didn't do that because uh, their stuff biodegraded, which today is kind of what we want, right? You know, it's much, right. much more sustainable. Um, they didn't leave that culture. They may not have been so expansive that they needed a written system of writing so they don't have those records. Trade may not have, may have been more local. You know, all the stuff that we say are values today. So that's one reason why sometimes it's hard to find uh, cultures to celebrate in, in Africa. Um, there are plenty of Twitter threads and Reddits and, you know, detailing, and there's lots of great history book. Um, you know, Henry Louis Gates has, a, you know, a book called The Wonders, African Wonders or something, which it really is just a, you know, coffee table book showing all the amazing material things that Africans have created. Um, so I think there's that need to, you know, desire to impart dignity to the African experience and say that, hey, we matter and we, we're valued. I will just say, though, that, um, you know, think about Downton Abbey. Think about how many people watch <laughs> Downton Abbey. Think about the Queen and um, all of these, you know, you can watch PBS or whatever channel and you're going to come across some depiction of European royalty. It's not, it's, a, it's, those are, you know, hot topics. People like to imagine themselves as the, you know, the, the queen or the princess or the prince. Um, and it's this kind of universal desire and interest. So I think it does appear in Afrofuturism for the reasons I've said, but it's, it's very much, it's a cross-cultural um, experience, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's funny. I really like those characters. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed the, the Artificer Queen segment. I think it's far too short. Um, 
but both of them, you know, and I think it is, it, it's an act of good writing. The characters find them, find them intimidating and maybe even a bit menacing. Um, your character is, you could play him as clearly afraid of a kind of uh, African invasion of Europe, right? As Sechuayo uh, is like a big talker and he has these like mechanical jaguars and uh, as you're flying in these uh, mechanical birds are following your airship and you know you can play your character is really shook by him uh, but it was funny I, I, I actually you get to meet the king there's some doubt and you get to meet him and he's very interested in your silly quest he finds it ridiculous that you work for this guy he's like either you're a slave or you're equals and, and you have to describe that you're somewhere in between um, but I thought he was like he was such a smart and kind of funny character and uh, and I was I was bummed that I wasn't able to kind of like have more of a give and take with him. And I, it, it was actually really hard to role play Passepartout as like open-minded about the, um, the sort of like comportment and politics of these African monarchs. Like they're, they're you know, they're played as alien. Like there's kind of a, there's a gulf between your European character and, and them that is hard to reconcile. Absolutely, yeah. I, I noticed that too, that um, as I said, you know, there's usually one and when you can make the choice that um, one of them is the, typical colonial attitude. Oh, um, I think he says, you know, you'll never defeat the British Empire. I don't know if yeah, it's you that can say that or another one, um, yeah. even though he's French um, originally. Uh, so it's, it's interesting um, that even this person who literally can control whether he lives or dies, he still feels superior. And uh, Sechuayo has this shard um, implanted in his brain that allows him to control all these creatures simultaneously, it's really just a brilliant, um, uh, you know, fun, fanciful idea. Yeah. Um, and he, his only, um, Passepartout's immediate thought is that he's crazy. You know, he doesn't think yeah. as in other, other places where he meets people of power that um, m maybe it's because they've accomplished something. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's still, I, I'm, I think it's better to have that in there than not to have it at all. And, you know, yeah. I think that's why I like the game. Yeah, it's intriguing that both of those characters, Rana Valona and Sechuayo, they're um, in violation of kind of Western European norms around the line between humans and technology. So the queen is not supposed to be able to be an artificer. There's some artificers guild rule that means they're not supposed to be in positions of, of monarchy. They're supposed to be a kind of transnational right. power center of their own. And then Sechuayo has broken a kind of unspoken taboo about Im embedding technology in the body. Um, that, and I, th I thought that was fascinating and something that you just have to kind of dwell on yourself as, as the reader and player, I think, but that, um, that, that they're kind of trying to forge different relationships to technology than you see in the, uh, in the European world that you, that you end up traveling through. Yeah. Um, should we, what do you think about questions? Uh, yeah, like let's take some questions for sure. Yeah. Um, so I want to start with Zara's questions. So Zara, you asked two questions. First is who, who the writer is. So um, the writer's name is Meg Giant. J-A-Y-A-N-T-H, uh, and she's written for a bunch of, of games, including Sunless Sea and Horizon Zero Dawn, which is like a really big uh, open world game um, that you can play on consoles as well as uh, PC. Uh, and yeah, her, her work is really, really great. As far as I know, she only writes for games. Um, and uh, Zara also asks, do you think the game is considered the multiple narratives and removed eth ethnocentrism, especially or specifically when it comes to areas like the Middle East? As, a, as I am Middle Eastern, I know there are many misconceptions about the history and stereotypes and encounter them all the time in the entertainment industry. So what were your impressions, uh, you know, as a, as a player and reader of, of the, the Middle Eastern uh, uh, sort of uh, elements of the game? Um, so I was so, because I was preparing for this conversation, um, I think I went through the Middle East the first time I played the game, and I don't remember it that well. Um, mm -hmm. I was trying to get down to Africa, and as we discussed, it's actually not that easy. So, um, but I, you know, when I played um, a couple of days ago, um, I felt it was thoughtful, but I, I didn't get it in enough detail, and I wasn't playing it in the way that um, uh, Zara is asking. So, um, mm -hmm. I have a feeling because of I, I don't want to speak to it, um, but I think it probably has some thoughtful, um, you know, characters, uh, but it's a reason to play the game. Yeah, some of the interactions that I've had in the, the, uh, in the Middle East geographies anyway in the game is that, you know, you do come across libraries and, seg and sort of centers of learning. You come across a, a number of like sort of scholarly 
class people um, in that part of the game. And it also, I think, does a good job, just from my limited understanding of the history of the region, that you know, it's a very cosmopolitan part of the game. You really see it as like, because it's, uh, it's this crossroads for trade, there's all these important sort of trade routes through, um, through the Middle East, um, that you end up meeting a lot of people from all over the world in those settings, which is true all over in this game. It's a game about people who are traveling all over the world and, and about diversity and sort of, um, you know, mixing and international trade routes and things like that. But like, I think they do a pretty good job just in my like, you know, kind of, again, bare memory of it, of, of making it seem like a sort of uh, vibrant crossroads instead of just like a place that, you know, falling into some stereotypes is like, you know, uh, only fundamentalist or is like, you know, ruthlessly expansionist or is backwards in some way. I think they do a really good job, um, at, at least in the level of like making it seem like a diverse and intellectually lively place. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, Alan uh, asks uh, for Deji, if you could make any video game that celebrates the African experience, what type of game would you make? Do you have a, do you have a, a, a sort of ambition to make a game, Deji? Um, I would love to be involved with the video game. Um, you know, my little brief um, try on Twine, um, it is, I would want a team to work with. Um, people who, uh, you know, there, there's just so many skills that go into video game making. Um, and actually, um, just a little aside, um, for, through, through my day job, we support an, an organization called Urban Arts Partnership that has a game studio for um, high school kids. Um, and that's pretty amazing to see um, when they learn everything about it. Um, and then at the end, you know, their final project is to make their own game or collaborate on the game together. Uh, so it's just a ton of work. Um, and, um, you know, it's, uh, so I would want to work with a team that knows how to do it. Um, there's some really exciting games that are coming out, um, you know, that are doing fantasy explorations of Africa. So that would be fun. Um, I think I might untether a little bit from, from Africa and, you know, um, expand uh, to other areas as well. Um, just having grown up in the United States personally. Um, but, um, you know, I think there's a lot of room. Um, there's a game in Cameroon um, called The Legend of Orion, I think it was called. And it was a Cameroonian game studio. Um, and I played that a little bit. It was kind of um, almost a little bit of a role-playing game. There's a big... Um, which Joey and I have discussed, there's a big um, you know, tabletop game coming out called the Wagadu Chronicles, which is again, fantasy. I think I'd be interested in exploring a, a science fiction one that's not, um, that's rooted in actual African culture in some way and not just, um, you know, uh, what you might call the Black Panther exploration mm -hmm. of, um, um, you know, fantasy imagining of, of Africa. So yeah, there's just so much to explore and there's so many good stories I have a feeling someone's working on it right now and we're gonna to get to see that in a few years. Uh, Judy asks, how do African mythologies feature in the game? Thank you, and I think that's my mom. Hi, mom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that might be the case. <laughs> Not that, uh, so mythologies, um, they're, Actually, I would say not that much. Um, it's more the, the lived uh, culture uh, that is, um, Joey, maybe you remember it differently, but I don't remember too much talk about gods or spirits. Um, and um, I think the place where it comes up is in closest to Haiti, but that's more people not understanding what Haitian culture is about and uh, talking about voodoo and being afraid of voodoo. Um, so I, I think it's, What's kind of cool about it is, except maybe the design of the ships and the design of the yeah. modes of transport um, have some root in the culture and the mythology, but I didn't come away thinking there was a lot of discussion of African mythology. Yeah, you can see some of those, um, yeah, you can see some of the iconography uh, transposed onto the ships and things like that. That is the main thing. I think, yeah, like, like you said, when you get into the Caribbean, there's these, this plot line about voodoo i think in some cases it's 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 trying to carry the idea of like europeans othering non-european peoples and then kind of reading their mythologies or misperceptions of their belief systems is threatening and then you know the game in, in, at its best moments gives you a chance to kind of unravel that and realize that that's kind of an unfounded and 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 myopic set of fears but like 
I, I don't think the mythology plays out so much in the game, except as like a sort of point of misunderstanding and uh, you know stereotyping that maybe exists to be to be dissolved uh, ideally. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have time for one more quick question, and then we'll have to say farewell. So Zoyander uh, asks a great question. That I'll do my best with. So uh, they say really interesting points earlier relating different pieces of writing within the game, not only uh, to when they appear, but also how game design places more friction in the way of some pieces of content. Do you have any thoughts on how the game uh, portrays and subverts the colonialist privilege of access to foreign lands, the idea of the entitlement to travel the world on a whim? And Zoyander finishes with the question, is, trans or is traversal political, which I quite like. Yeah, I think that that comes across in the original uh, Jules Verne novel, that it is a privilege. And, and that's you know, part of the concept of the story. Uh, if, you, if you don't know the original story, there's two things going on. There's this bet that uh, he can go around the world in, 20, in 80 days uh, and he's going to earn 20,000 pounds. But at the same, but he takes 20,000 pounds with him uh, to travel. And at the same time, there is a bank robbery of 20,000 pounds from the Bank of England, which I guess is a thing. I didn't know that. Uh, but it, there, <laughs> um, so there's this duel, like he's being pursued by the police who think he committed the crime and he's doing the 80 days and it's unclear until the end whether he is the criminal. So there's a lot going on. So there's this idea of privilege or did he steal it? Um, I do think the ability, to, I even think today, the ability to travel is a privilege. And it, it, it's uh, underscored right now in, in this moment, uh, you know, in the COVID-19 moment where people who are used to having that mobility and travel are unhappy. There are lots of people who never had that um, uh, privilege uh, at all. Um, and it, it's suddenly an equalizing force um, in some ways. I mean, there's so much about the pandemic that is not equal. Uh, but the, the inability to travel is certainly a privilege even today. And um, I think it was then. And um, in terms of the colonial attitude, you are a, a butler, um, you know, called a valet in the, in the story. Um, so your very class is playing a role. Um, it, it, except what's fun about the game is you're actually the one deciding where to go. And, um, you know, that might probably wouldn't have, I don't, as I said, I don't think that happened in the original book. So I, I think um, travel and the ability to see the world is absolutely a privilege um, that is, is worth remembering. Yeah, I'll add, I'll add two things. One of which, uh, Zoander, is that one of the sets that you can get, I think I mentioned earlier, is the uh, English gentleman set or something like that. And if you have that, you can negotiate prices and travel times um, more aggressively. You're more likely to be able to move quicker and sometimes cheaper. Uh, and that is surprising. Um, if you if you have extra money, um, you can buy these like expensive items, which will sometimes make, make people talk to you more. You can like, if, if you have gin and you're talking to someone who likes gin, you can like give them some of your gin and they'll like tell you more about where to go or, you know, a quicker way to get from place to place. So it kind of does like try to literalize that idea if, if you have more resources or if you have more like Western European cultural clout, you might be able to like wield it to get around the world quicker. And the other thing is that, um, one of the funny, I think, game mechanics in this game, um, it's never a good situation when you have to do this, but you can run out of money. And if you do, you can get like an infinite amount of money out of the bank. You just have to wait for it. Everyone will give Fog money. Uh, like you can get like, you know, a, few, a couple thousand pounds in the late 19th century. And which is probably like a titanic amount of money, I imagine, with inflation. <laughs> and you just have to wait a week. And a week is terrible. But like somebody's just going to advance you that line of credit anywhere in the world just because you're you're an English gentleman. And so I think there there is kind of this um, cognizance in the game that like privilege will get you a lot of places, and that the British Empire has this symbolic and uh, hard power uh, uh, clout that like that everybody respects uh, and that can make the game easier in a way. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that it, it, Joey. I know we're at time, but um, yeah. you know. It, the, in a big part of this, the novel is um, you know, money being stolen. And um, it does happen in the game as well that you can have money stolen from you. But it's, it, it makes you reflect on today where you know, if, if, if your house was burning down and you had to get out, what would you take? You'd probably take your cell phone because you mm -hmm. know you could eventually get money off of your cell phone or right. whether it's through a payment system and just, um, you know, that's a, another, again, an issue that's come up uh, with the pandemic is that some folks who, you know, 
prefer cash. But there was this, if you're making a trip like this, there was this threat to your person um, because you had money and you had signals of wealth and that you probably had money somewhere on your person. You couldn't hide it. Um, so the bank thing is interesting because um, it does, it is this escape route, but there's just, you know, it just shows how much things have changed today that, uh, you know, the amount of, you know, money that you would carry on your person is different. Um, that's not the, what's being credited or, or being valued. Um, so it's just kind of a fun thing to think about um, that in the Jules Verne, you know, when I was reading it, he has like 20 different, as, as a story, as a uh, novelist, um, he has so many layers of tension and so many mm -hmm. plot points that happen that like, I'm like, I don't think any of those would be acceptable in today's writing, but he was just <laughs> trying to hook, you know, as soon as they are happy, something goes wrong. Someone, you know, they, yeah. they, you know, get buried alive or burned alive. And, you know, there's all this stuff, like a million different things um, where, you know, in a game it can kind of work out. But I was just thinking, wow, I don't know if you could write this story today. Um, it's really it maximalist. Universal, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's almost pulpy. Yeah. There's like a lot, there is a lot of, it's like, if you don't like one narrative line, there's another one for you to grab on. Yeah, it's it's coming, from like, a different genre yeah. in a way. Right. Like, yeah, uh, yeah he's going to keep you turning, turning the pages. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It doesn't follow rules of narrative economy that most publishing houses would probably try to enforce on you today. Um, okay. So we are at time and, and Deji, I want to thank you so much for joining me today and for such a fun conversation. Um, could you just tell everyone where the best place is to find out more about you and, and, and your work online? Thanks, Joey. So I'm on Twitter um, at Olutron. Um, if you want to stay off Twitter for reasons I completely understand right now, um, then you can find me at returnofthedeji.com, D-E-J-I. Um, I have a story coming out in uh, Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. Um, and uh, that's Harper Collins, so you should be able to to, to get that. Sorry, it's Houghton Mifflin. Sorry, sorry, publisher. Um, but you should be able to get that soon. So um, please check out that story if you just want to read a short story instead of a full book. Yeah, and we'll be publishing a short story of Deji's early in 2021 um, about clean energy futures that takes place in San Antonio. That's uh, fabulous as well. So. Um, and uh, I just want to take a moment to thank all my colleagues at the Center for Science and the Imagination for making this event possible and supporting the series, and especially to Tyler Eglin, who uh, ran our videos today and edited the videos as well. Um, keep an eye out for our next episode of CSI Skill Tree later this year. Uh, to get notified about episodes, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter at ImaginationASU, and visit us at csi.asu.edu, where you can subscribe to our email list. Uh, Thank you so, so much for being here today. And, and uh, uh, Deji, once again, thank you so much for bringing this game to my attention and, and talking about it with me. Thanks, Joey. Right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, everyone.